Good morning. Welcome. My name is Patrick Muhlenschulter, the Managing Director of the Washington Ballet. And I'm really excited to welcome you here this morning to the first of our series called Bar Talk. This series was set up as a special way of saying thank you to our donors who have kept us going through these terrible times. When COVID hit, we were no longer able to perform in theatres, we weren't able to uh, teach our classes live, and that had uh, a pretty devastating impact on our budget. Staff were furloughed, dancers were furloughed, um, but we found that by creating arts, our commitment and our passion for delivering great ballet, great ballet education was actually stronger. Thanks to your support, we can do that during these difficult times and look forward to sharing with you some of that work that we've been doing this morning. As Belletta means, you are the lifeblood of the Washington Ballet. Thank you. Let's introduce our wonderful artistic director, Julie Kent. Julie, good morning. How are you? Good morning, good morning Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Where are you broadcasting from this morning? Um, broadcasting from our home office in North Washington, <laughs> D.C. Uh, so. And how are you feeling these days, Julie? Oh, uh, well, I, I think it's um, challenges give you the opportunity for growth and um, the, the, and the inspiration that you receive from seeing individuals thrive and succeed under um, remarkable circumstances is really, um, you know, it, it, it's what keeps you going. So. Well, thank you so much for being with here uh, with us this morning and also for inspiring and us leading us through all of this difficult time at the ballet. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Natalie Rouland. Dr. Rouland is the senior advisor for the Billington Cultural Initiative at the Kennan Institute here in Washington, DC. A scholar of Russian literature, culture, and performing arts, Dr. Rouland is currently completing her first book called Ballet Empire, the Russian Era. She currently serves as TWB's inaugural scholar in residence, uh, where she has advised us on the 2019 production of The Sleeping Beauty and um, the uh, premiere of Swan Lake, which we are hoping to perform early in spring next year. Dr. Roland, how are you this morning? I'm doing well, thank you, Patrick. We're very excited that you're going to be hosting, actually, the Bar Talk series. <laughs> Yes, I'm Thank very excited. Being... Wonderful opportunity. You were last uh, doing a pre-ballet uh, talk for us at the Reach at the Kennedy Centre. Exactly. How are, you, how are you faring working from home at the moment? Actually, I'm doing well with all of my books. I have my library around me, my sunshine, and so I'm very content. Um, I miss, of course, being in the studio, getting to see the works being produced, but it is wonderful also to have the time to really focus on my writing. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for um, taking us through this special journey this morning. And thank you again to our Balladomains who are sharing this morning with us. Over to you, Natalie and Julie. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Patrick, for your kind introduction. And thank you to Julie, the staff of the Washington Ballet, and the generous support of the Balletomain Society for bringing this series to life. This is our first of eight Bar Talks. Julie and I will be hosting Bar Talk one Friday a month which has a special historical significance as the Washington Ballet co-founders, Lisa Gardner and Mary Day, hosted a series of intimate ballet evenings during World War II called Fridays at Nine. So we'll hope that you'll continue to join us for our exclusive behind the scenes conversations on Fridays at 10. Mm -hmm. Just a technical note, this is a private conversation for subscribers of the Washington Ballet. So please feel free to post any comments or questions on the sidebar to the right, and we'll have a chance at the end to open it up to discussion. Julie, let's start off our conversation. Would you share with our ballet lovers what awaits us in the season of joy? I'm more than happy to. I, I think when I first hear a season of joy, it brings me back to when we conceived the idea uh in late 2019 before any of us had ever heard of the coronavirus um and we had 
planned just a, a really exciting season with um, Cinderella and Ratmansky evening and all sorts of um, uh, new and ant productions with great anticipation. Well, um, as we all know, the, the pandemic uh, arrived and um, altered um, our, our path forward. Mm -hmm. As I always said to the dancers, we were sort of building a bridge, you know, that everything that everything that they had been working for and towards was still waiting for them on the other side. And so as time progressed, we realized that bridge is just a bit longer than, than any of us anticipated. But uh, the question immediately shifted to, well, if we can't do what was originally planned, what can we do? And that sort of, um, growth mindset, positive outlook, um, and focus on our mission, which is to present uh, the best of classic and contemporary ballet on the world stage and to teach our students and to educate our community about ballet and dance um, was still possible. And um, so while you are, uh, usually we begin our season with our next steps program, which again is a, for those of you who don't know, it's an evening of new work created by both celebrated and emerging choreographers of our, of the 21st century. Um, and considering all of the travel limitations and really unknowns that we're all coping with, we just looked inward at the remarkable depth of talent that we have in our company, in all the areas, in all departments, in the many talents of our dancers, in our production department, in our artistic department, in our as our scholar in residence. Um, and so this foray uh, into the creative process during a pandemic um, is very, very exciting, rewarding, and, and that, that's how Create in Place was really born. Well, it's a wonderful concept. Could you tell us a bit about the four pieces for Create in Place that we'll see this fall and winter? And could you also tell us a bit about the process of choosing um, the Washington Ballet dancers who aspire to be choreographers? Do all the dancers want to be choreographers? How do you go about choosing the ones uh, to showcase right. the work? So <clears throat> our four dancer choreographers um, are Tamash Krisha, um, Siamara Reyes, who is the head of our professional training division and my former colleague at American Ballet Theater, Andile Lovu, and Elga Paris Morales. Um, so three dancers, in uh, two dancers in our company, one dancer in our studio company, and one of our uh, professional training the professional training division head. Um, not all dancers are are interested in choreography, um, but the ones that are need opportunity, and it's always been challenging trying to find create those opportunities. Although. We, we have succeeded and, and I think um, for those of you who joined us for our gala in May, you were able to see the choreographic talents of both Tamash and Elga uh, shining really brightly in, in Tamash's Parada Together part and in Elga's tribute to the center stage. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, the work definitely speaks for itself. Let's take a sneak peek now at Tamash's Forbidden Endearment in the studio. So beautiful. Um, yes. Julie and I are very honored. <laughs> Julie and I are very honored to have Tomasz with us today. Um, Tomasz hails from Hungary and has received numerous international awards as a dancer, as well as serving on the faculty of the Washington School of Ballet. 
We also have the honor to have Elga Paris Morales with us, studio company dancer. Elga was born in Puerto Rico, attended the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, and is an up and coming young choreographer to watch. Good morning, Tomas. How are you today? Good morning. I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. How long have you been dancing with the company? Uh, I think this is my 13th season with the company. I think I started 2007, 7, 8. That was the first season for me. So if my math is correct, then it's the 13th. Perfect. And this is not your first time choreographing for the Washington Ballet? No, 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 it, it's not. But definitely one of the most precious moments for me. This, this one's really close to my heart. That's wonderful. And Elga, welcome. How are you this morning? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Doing well, thanks. So you recently joined the Washington Ballet. Could you tell us about how you and Julie first met? Oh, yeah. So um, we met um, in, a, in an ABT summer intensive that I attended in California. Um, that summer was crazy for me because I was actually very intentionally auditioning for um, schools to attend the following year, um, ballet schools. And so I went to the ABT summer intensive with every intention to meet Julie Kent mm -hmm. and to ask her if she could audition me for the JKO. And so it was really interesting how it all happened. It was a three week intensive. We didn't get to see Julie till like the very last day. We um, had class with her, she gave us a seminar and then we um, had our showcase and she came and it was just so lovely to meet her for the very first time. Um, um, I could, I was just like enveloped in her warmth and her humanity. And for me, that was very refreshing to meet like such an icon that everyone is like so looking forward to me and then just be humbled by realizing that she's a mother and she's she's so caring and she she's really down to earth and so i love meeting her um and i asked her if she could audition me and she was like absolutely mm -hmm. um, but it was crazy everything was happening towards the end of the summer so everyone was already enrolling and Long story short, instead of going to JKO, Julie emailed me and asked me to come with her to DC. And so that was the day that changed my life. And that was obviously the best choice. Well, good, we're so happy that you're here. And um, I know you've both, you and Tamash have both been dancing at home alone together. I know that must have impacted your experience quite a bit. Um, Tamash, you've been dancing at home, but not entirely alone. You've had your beautiful wife and partner, Maki Anuki, with you. How has your dancing partnership flourished during your time at home? Uh, it, it was it was very interesting. Uh, it was fun, of course, but it's very, very challenging because the the space, the limit of the space, it's very limited. So that, that definitely gave us a lot of challenge. And we cannot really do partnering. We call it pas de deux because of the height of the ceiling and and stuff like that. We even get some noise complaints. So if <laughs> one of the one of the viewers is from from this building, I'm sorry. But I kind of wear it as a badge of honor. I think it was it was a fun period, even though it's it's these are dark times, you know. But uh that that's it. The other thing is, you know, for Bali we were we were taught to since our baby years, we were taught to move big, occupy all the space, move stage left, stage right, front and back. Right now, it's a little bit feels like being a bird in a cage. You can't really fly, but you're trying. Mm -hmm. So that's how, it, I don't know, that's the analogy I would use for this experience. Well, Tamash, could you tell us about your first work for Create in Place Forbidden Endearment? Uh, yes. Uh, in a nutshell, the story, the basic of the story is, is about love, finding love mm -hmm. and and losing loved ones. Kind of fitting for this environment we are right now in. And and also it's a it's it's a love story. Mm -hmm. The the third person in this in this uh, love triangle is death itself. We can't really get to see death 
because I, I, I consider this as a condensed version of my piece, but, but we get to see their, uh, their servants. I call mm -hmm. them their death minions or something like that. And, uh, and basically, yes, it's basically about losing someone, finding someone mm -hmm. and that constant battle between, uh, between these things. It's fascinating. Before we talk more in depth about, about the work, let's take a look at the filming of Forbidden Endearment. Well, this is just so stunning. I give chills every time I watch this section. Um, I really love it so much. So congratulations, Tomash. So you mentioned in the past that some of your favorite roles as a dancer are Albrecht and Giselle, and Siegfried and Swan Lake. Have any particular ballets or choreographers influenced the Indian endearments? Uh, so, sorry, Natalia, I was, I was having some problems with that. Oh, yes, of course. So just of course. So in the past, you've mentioned that some of your favorite roles as a dancer are Albrecht and Giselle and Siegfried and Swan Lake. Are there any roles or ballets or choreographers that have actually influenced Forbidden Endearment? Um, not quite. Maybe, maybe subconsciously, but mm -hmm. not, not me uh, trying to take influences from them. Uh, I think one of the biggest influence was... Uh, was the music of course it's a beautiful music by blake neely that was one yeah. of the big influence and, could you uh, talk a bit about how you you commissioned an original score is that correct yes <laughs> that sounds very <laughs> serious but yes uh, <laughs> uh, we get to meet blake blake was actually he is a composer who did uh mm, the music for the piece that we were doing in the uh, in the gala, mm -hmm. and and he actually got to see the gala performance, and then he wrote a letter to the ballet, which I think Julie and Julie shared with us. And immediately I started to write him back, "Thank you so much," and, and all that kind of things. From there on, kind of like a French friendship flourished. Right. And then two or three weeks later, Julie asked me like, how do you feel about choreographing? And it kind of felt like puzzle pieces falling into place without you looking for what's going where, it just naturally fall, fell into place. So it was an obvious choice to use him. And I'm really happy about that. And did you record the score on Zoom? I, I recall from, I believe, Maki's Instagram. Yeah, tell us more about that. Thank you for bringing that one up. Yes. Uh, Blake is super committed, whatever we do or whatever he does as well. So he, so he commissioned the Hungarian National Symphony, Budapest mm -hmm. National Symphony, to record the music, and he invited us over a Zoom call to see how that process goes, and it was super, super interesting. Oh, that's wonderful. I've also noticed that your costumes are designed by a fellow dancer, Washington Ballet Studio Company dancer, Nicholas Cowden, designed one of the costumes. Is that correct? Could you tell us the story behind the sleeves, the flowing sleeves? Yes. Uh, yes, he, he did design the, the costumes for, the, for that part. That's actually the part of the Death Minions that I mentioned mm -hmm. before. And the sleeves, it came as... I was trying to, we, were, we are under so many uh, restrictions, you know, but all of these are put into place because of our safety. Mm -hmm. One of which is the six feet, 10 feet uh, uh, social distancing, even while you are dancing. So I wanted to break that one up a little bit. So I was thinking if people have like really long arms or something, long sleeves, then they can 
they can maybe partner or looks like that they are partnering. So I envision these long sleeves that can be used as an extended arm. And I think they work fabulously. That's what I think. Uh, there was some funny moment on the recordings when we were doing it with water, but I keep that memory for myself. It was really fun. <laughs> No, they look wonderful. And I know, Elga, you also worked with Nicholas to co-design your costumes. Is that correct? Yes. Nicholas is actually a really, really good friend of mine. And he came over one day. Um, um, he offered to help with the costumes and to help me design them. So we just hung out one day and had a conversation. Um, he had read the book where I got the inspiration for the ballet from. And so we were able to um, sit down and look at a bunch of other designs from many different cultures and kind of to get the overall shapes and color palettes that we wanted. Um, and we just started from there. We listed shapes and patterns and then we got materials put in there, what kind of fabrics we were gonna use and, uh, all this before we gave it to the head of costuming and wardrobe, um, to Monica Leyland, who took it on from there and her and Nicholas just did an incredible job um, creating these costumes. They look, yes, I'm very excited to see the final product. And actually for those of us who would like to see more on uh, the Washington Ballet's To The Point blog, you can actually catch a glimpse of behind the curtain of costume design with Nicholas Hayden. So we'll send you a link to that as well if you're interested in looking at that. So Elga, moving on to your piece, could you talk a little bit about Womb of Heaven? Did you have a particular story or concept in mind for your piece? Um, my piece was inspired by the book Sapiens by Yuval Noah Hahari. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a book of anthropology, human evolution. And it was also inspired by a lot of um, common conversations that I've been having with strangers and with friends and family about the times that we're in and how um, humanity always goes in circles. You know, we will we'll reach an enlightenment period only to start all over. And it's almost as you see these circles throughout history where we repeat history in a different context. Mm -hmm. um, and so really that was a huge inspiration for um, my piece, um, Womb of Heaven. Um, the title womb of heaven is this the idea that earth is the womb of heaven you know we are the only galaxy with so much intelligent and developed life mm -hmm. um, that we know of you know and so i think that's so special that we're all like earth's children mm -hmm. and i wanted to create a piece that was so so much about humanity so um yeah technically there is no set storyline but what you would see in this ballet is uh, a series of experiences that tend to have rep rep um, repeated patterns mm -hmm. in terms of themes. So, yeah. Well, that definitely seems to connect both with Fiamara's Kronos, which is about also that transition of waiting. And also Tomasz's piece has um, in his description of it, um, of the space of the in-between. I love that idea that he describes on the website um, where the death falls in love with the, the ballerina. Um, and then she, after she dies, she's in this sort of space of in-between, not quite dead, not quite alive. And so these ideas of, um, transition are very significant for this period. And I think that's wonderful that yours connects with that as well. Let's go behind the scenes now and see Womb of Heaven in the studio. Elgo, could you break down the sequence of steps that we see here and tell us where they fit into your larger work? Yes, yeah, so this is occurring um, in the second act of the ballet where mm -hmm. we start to see a structure of civilization. We start to mm -hmm. see people gathering around, which is a, a contrast to the beginning of the ballet where everyone is more free, um, mm -hmm. everyone is, by themselves kind of representing 
a birth. So what you're seeing right now is a quiet moment in this act two where you are seeing the contrast between being restricted to movement because mm -hmm. um, the dancers will be sitting on a chair and a set in like a table setting mm -hmm. and then versus not being restricted to this these confined spaces um so here the women are representing and and dancing uh their own freedom and their own individuality within that context and what is the music that you're using in that section um i'm using a, a piece of music called introspection that was mm -hmm. actually composed by sonia morales who is my mother um, my mom is an internationally well-known composer from latin america she was one of the very few women in her time to be um, composing classical and neoclassical works um, internationally. And um, not just because she's my mama, but <laughs> in general, her, her music really speaks to me. Um, it's very complex, but there's so much, I can see the colors that bleed through the music. Um, and I just thought it would be a great idea to be able to use some original works. It has always been a dream of mine to incorporate my mother's compositions mm -hmm. into a dance or into a ballet. And I did not think that I would be given the opportunity during her lifetime. And so I'm actually incredibly grateful to be able to share this with my mom. That's so wonderful. Julie mentioned that you also use some other pieces as well, different composers. Yes. Your your uncle is a clarinetist, is that correct? Yeah. So <laughs> I have come from a family of musicians. So like I'm the black sheep, I'm the dancer. <laughs> Everyone else plays instruments. And so I there's four pieces of music in this ballet, and three of them are original works from my my mom's side of the family mm -hmm. one of them is so i have an uncle who he's the head percussionist for the lion king on broadway he's been there for 20 years and he is an incredible percussionist he plays all over new york city has many albums of his own so i called him up one day and asked him if he had any extra like beats or rhythm patterns that from him practicing that i could use because i really wanted to use a section where there was just percussion. Mm -hmm. um, we don't use percussion a lot in ballets, and I thought it would be so beautiful to use really raw instruments in a, in, in a ballet that's about humanity to use the first instruments that we had, right? Which is the drums and the, the, the bells. Mm -hmm. So he recorded something for me in two hours after we talked about what the scene was, what was happening in that part of the ballet, and so, he really created something special and unique for this, which is really exciting. Well, let's see another excerpt from Womb of Heaven and we can hear a different musical selection in this section. I love that Elga, is that you? Um, on yes, <laughs> I was so excited. Part of the score there. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about this duet or pas de deux featuring Nicole Granero and Oscar Sanchez? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, they, okay, so this section of the ballet where we have one pas de deux, um, also keeping in mind that due to the restrictions for our safety, um, not everyone could partner together. We could mm -hmm. only use um, couples that actually lived together, that were actually together mm -hmm. so to partner. And so Oscar and Nicole, um, who are in my group, were the perfect choice, and they're just such beautiful dancers. And I wanted to uh, create a pas de deux that um, was it romantic? Um, mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted something that was a little bit more um, complex and raw of what mm -hmm. it is to have a relationship, like what mm -hmm. is a union, you know, mm -hmm. which is not just all love and, and like romance. It's it's very turbulent too. It can be very complicated. It's a lot of uh, I'm supporting you and you support me, give and take. Um, 
at least that's what I've received in my 20 years experience and what <laughs> love and relationships can be. And so I wanted to create a pa that really showcased this. The music is chaotic, but it has moments where it's very whimsical. And so mm -hmm. I wanted the um, choreography to also match that. However, choreographing a pa -da -da with limited partnering experiences and limit to being able to actually physically be a part of it. Because mm -hmm. of course, when you're creating a pot of dough, you have to keep in mind the safety of the dancer. You have to look at the transition and you need to see where it's coming from. Um, the technique behind all the steps that are involved can be really quite complicated. Right. And so the difficulty of envisioning that and anticipating that um, when you can't physically do that fully, kind of like what Tomas said, it feels like you're kind of a bird trapped in a cage. But we had, of course, Oscar um, Sanchez and Nicole Reinero, they're super pros and they're incredible, mm -hmm. incredible artists. Um, I have such an honor to be working with people of such amazing talent um people that i look up to that i have been looking up to for all these years and so they were really helpful they um i wanted them to have a lot of input the whole process of this choreography was really a conversation of what makes you feel comfortable how can we work through this um uh, okay this is the idea of the step that i have now how would you translate that how would how would that work for you um and so it was it was like that Oh, that's so wonderful. I'm very excited to see the final the final piece. And um, the finishing touch for ballet production is the set or stage design. For Create in Place, this was actually a custom-built stage set for filming at the Washington Ballet Warehouse. George Balanchine famously wrote, the importance of ballet for motion pictures is the element of pure fantasy. Julie, were there any fantastical moments during the filming of Create in Place? I think the whole <laughs> filming was a fantastic moment. Um, first, finding a location. Um, in DC, you're not allowed to be unmasked in public. So we had to look outside. And um, Tamash being this um, one of, for those of you who don't know, his mind and his imagination and his interest in film and angles and music and dance. I mean, it's very, very layered. And so he was already, as soon as I <clears throat> sort of gave the landscape of what we were looking for, he already went to where can we do this and started searching for location and understanding again, the complexity, uh, looked at our new warehouse location um, and found a little grassy area mm -hmm. or, or, or parking lot where perhaps we could set up the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and what the, the miracle was, oh, it's, a, it's a curved concrete, mm -hmm. but again, calling on our, our really talented in-house production and uh, CC Goldar, um, lighting um, electrician, mm -hmm. she did beautiful lighting. And all of a sudden, when the first picture that I saw, I said, it looks like Lincoln Center. You know, it was that kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, very, two very different feelings for um, Tamash's piece and for CMR Reyes' pieces, Kronos, which was filmed at the same location. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think uh, not only was it, again, the, these layered talents of all of our team, uh, choreographer, production, um, artistic, but then Tamash had in his in-between section where that you mentioned earlier, between life and death, he had envisioned it as a water scene mm -hmm. so that the women could see their reflection and that we were, <laughs> our team, our production team was going to have to find a way to f flood the stage yeah. and keep the water and, you know, and, and as it turned out, uh, mother nature provide us, provided us with this 
soft but constant rain for several hours. And our, our beautiful dancers just gave so generously. Um, and uh, Tamasha, I don't know if you want to add just how inspiring it was that they, they were both, you know, they were challenged, but so excited to meet the challenge and sort of dance um, with the rain and under the circumstances. And so when you see the finished product um, on Marquee TV uh, mm -hmm. later this month, I hope that you, when you see the raindrops and, and, and feel that ambiance, that it was, was just very much this serendipitous, wonderful, exciting sort of marriage of of inspiration, intention, nature, mm -hmm. determination, and the human spirit. So. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Tamash, did you feel, as Julie was just asking, did you feel that um, seeing your piece filmed, did it change the choreographic vision you had? Because obviously the camera comes from different angles rather than just the straight shot that the audience would have in a traditional theatrical venue. How did you feel about the filming process? Uh, I, I love the filming process. So, so that was that was very very fun. Also a little bit uh, uh, not nervous, but you have that tension before because you never really know how how, how it's gonna quite work out. Mm -hmm. Especially because we can't really get to see our own ballet because we work in little five dancer in one studio, five in the other. So this is the first time when I get to see the whole piece together. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was very interesting, and also I think it required a different set of fives or different set of mindset. Right. Because when you choreograph with uh, film in mind, mm -hmm. you have different challenges. Some that's easier to do, some that's harder. I think one of the hardest one for me is figuring out how to bring dancers on stage. You know, normally on stage you have wings where you can just go in and out. Here you don't really have that, but you still want to make it seamless. So you have to use your imagination and how you would edit, how you would put it together so it would seem seamless. And of course, thinking of about the angles too, because normally you choreograph just being viewed from the front, right. but you do know the camera is going to move around. And you have to think about as well that it would look better in other angles too so it was fun process for sure and what julie said i want i just want to echo that as well that day the the rainy day was incredibly special and i wish i could uh, describe it better but i can't describe it any better than julie did <laughs> it is really good but i would just say the same thing it was super special so Julie, you'll also be filming Womb of Heaven and Something Human on Delay's works as well. When will that filming start? Next week. Next week. Oh, that's yeah. exciting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, exciting. And Delay's set, uh, I believe, is the Patapsco Women's Institute in Ellicott City, Maryland. So mm -hmm. again, quite exciting, dramatic, uh, outdoor location and uh, Elga is planning chose a location at the Wheaton uh, Park. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the the correct title? Elga? Yes, it's the it's the Wheaton, Wheaton Regional, Regional Park. It has a lot of areas and it's huge. Um, it's a beautiful. And so park. Elga, are you keeping the camera angles in mind when you're in the studio, or will you just sort of see how it goes? When Absolutely. <laughs> um, Actually, when I first started cr thinking about this ballet, I didn't even think about steps. I thought about camera. I started storyboarding um, the scenes in accordance to the sections that I knew had to occur in the ballet. Mm -hmm. And then when we got to the studio, it was a matter of putting the steps on the bodies mm -hmm. and reorganizing all of the cues and the angles in accordance to where their bodies are now, you know? Right. And so it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving parts, because, um, for example, I will have one section where technically all the dancers are together. Mm -hmm. However, we will rehearse it in such a way where it's half of us downstairs, 
in the England studios and half of us in the Philips studios. And I have my little headset looking like Britney Spears, looking over at the Zoom. And the dancers are actually doing everything together, but they're not together. So it'll be interesting, like Tomas said, when the day that we film, because that's the one day that we'll actually see it all together. Um, and I'm excited. Every I, I, I explained it to the dancers. I was like, think of yourself as a point on a grid. OK. And no matter where you are, whether we're going to be dancing in the, the park, in the field, or near mm -hmm. the pond, or near the lake, like this is your point on the grid in accordance to all and relative to all the other dancers in the space. And so thinking of it in that sense versus, you know, if we were in a stage, we'd have actual marks, wow. um, the quarter marks, the eighth marks, the center mark. We don't have mm -hmm. these points of references. So we are each other's points of reference and also communicating to the dancers in a much more deeper level mm -hmm. of how the camera can just translate mm -hmm. any anywhere your eyes go any any intention in your body um, can be seen in that camera and so in stage on stage it's uh a little bit flatter you get to see every section you can see everyone from every perspective however when you're in in the camera on film everything is much more detailed you can zone in um, in a section where you're dancing you never actually think about what your arm is doing because you every your energy is everywhere the camera is gonna catch where your arm is doing um, your the camera is gonna catch where your eyes are looking and so I was trying to connect that with the dancers on a deeper level um, and expressing to them that in every moment of the ballet, you are being, you are, you are a character, um, and just to really immerse themselves into the world that we created, really, so that the camera could really read it. Well, the difference between um, the theatrical venue for the dance experience and the filmed experience actually brings me to the last question I wanted to ask for Julie which is how do you feel that the experience of dance as we know it will change with a digital season? Well, one of the remarkable aspects of capturing our beautiful dancers and our beautiful company on film is that we get to share it with an international audience instantly. And so even with our, our gala again uh, in May, we reached over 10,000 computers. So depending on the numbers that we're watching uh, the screen, that, that's, that's a huge audience for, for our company. And we're just very excited about that. Um, now, for me, when the curtain rises is when the magic really happens, but we can't do that now. And we can do this. and. Also, personally, I know the impact just in my own career of having a performance captured for all time and shared. And there is great impact and reach. And so working towards working towards the live experience where the ephemeral nature of our art form, where we all share it together. And then as soon as it curtains down, it's just your memory, my memory, your memory. Mm -hmm. And we have that forever. Um, and then end this. So having having both is, I think, a really ex exciting next stage. I also just wanted to, when both Elga and Tamash were mentioning, just the the challenges of having never having their entire cast together right. in one room because of our our safety. Um, restrictions and health and safety protocol. I just also want to recognize the incredible efforts and hours and labor and um, talent that went into developing our reopen plan by our medical coordinator, our company physician, our partnership with AGMA, the dancers union, and our facilities crew who are cleaning and, you know, the, the the details and layers and love and time and attention that are 
that are being put into every aspect of our existence in our school, in our development department, in our marketing department, in our artistic production facilities, like every aspect of our company is just rising to the occasion mm -hmm. in a very, very inspiring and remarkable way. And I think everybody um, in, in our audience today would just um, the support that you're lending us is allowing us to, to continue that great effort and just wanted to thank all of you and, and thank everyone within the organization as well for making this create in place possible because without everybody's collective effort, um, it wouldn't happen. So, Thank you so much, Julie. And now we have the chance to open up our discussion to our members. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to add them. Um, I know that some have been asking for Elga to mention her mother again. People are very interested in your mother. Could you could you tell a bit more about her and, and her name yes. so people could? Absolutely. So my mother's full name is Sonia Yvette Morales Mazos. So <laughs> we have slightly different last names. Um, and she went to um, the Performing Arts University in Puerto Rico is where she began. Mm -hmm. um, she toured with this famous salsa band called Plena Libre for many years before um, having children. And um, during that time, she created uh, multiple neoclassical compositions for the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra as well as the New York Symphony Orchestra. Um, she has operas that she has created as, and she has worked with um, uh, dancers in Puerto Rico. Um, you can find her some of her work on iTunes mm -hmm. and uh, on YouTube, you can look her up on YouTube, she's out there. Um, but yes, my mother also studied in Berkeley mm -hmm. and the Indiana University Music School for many years. So I'm really proud of her and I love her work, truthfully. Did you study music as well? Are you a musician? Oh my God, my parents tried so hard. So I actually played like four instruments. I played saxophone, oboe, mm -hmm violin and piano when I was a kid. And this was all while I was taking ballet after school. So it would be like ballet after school four times a week. And then I would have like violin and oboe practices in between. It was too much, it was too much. And I just, I, I, would, fail, I would fail to practice my oboe because I just wanted to go to ballet. And finally it got to a point where I really, really, wanted to dedicate my time to ballet because you got you have to first of all right. and second of all I really wanted to and so my parents were like oh, okay 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 you're doing something you're doing ballet okay so that's <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question we have a question for Tamash Tamash what was it like filming with cameras circling around you does that impact the choreography and did it take a while to get used to uh. I think it took like zero time to get used to it. It was, you know, we are, when we are dancing, there is, the dancers are always moving around you. So it was just like another cast in the body. That's how I saw it and didn't pay much attention to it. It wasn't too challenging, but when I look at it back from the outside, I, I find it funny to see uh, Wes, his, his name is Wes, he's ninja walking. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and trying to not be in the way of anybody. So it wasn't that challenging for me per se, because he was watching what he's seeing in the camera. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he could be sometimes in somebody else's way. Right. Uh, so I think it's more challenging for him not to step on us <laughs> than for us, because dancers just go over. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, thank you very much to Julie, Tamash, and Elga for joining us today. It's thank been a wonderful, you. 
It's been a wonderful conversation, and we look forward to seeing both of your pieces this fall for Tamasha's piece, Forbidden Endearment, Womb of Heaven this winter, both on Marquee TV as part of the Washington Ballet Season of Joy. So thank you both, very, all of you, very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our Ballet de Mont Society, our subscribers, and our donors for your continued commitment to the Washington Ballet. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on November 6th for our next episode of Bar Talk. Thank you.